Europe and the Western world have a weight problem. Nothing surprising in that, you may think. You have all heard of the obesity epidemic, haven't you? Well, think again. Obesity is one form of malnutrition. It is bad nutrition associated with overnutrition. But the other side of the malnutrition coin is undernutrition, where people suffer from a deficiency and imbalance of energy, protein and other nutrients. This has an adverse effect on people's well-being, body function and ability to fight disease. In general, malnutrition is commonly referred to as undernutrition. Malnutrition can occur because a person is not getting enough food, or when adequate nutrients are consumed in the diet, but they're not well digested or absorbed properly. In hospital-related malnutrition, this can result in compromised immune responses, increased risk of infections, poor wound healing, delayed recovery from illness, and longer hospitalization. Malnutrition is often associated in people's minds with uh, low weight or, or obesity, but it's bigger than that. It's more fundamental than that. It goes right to the heart of our health and our ill health, and it's inextricably mixed with some diseases, and food is often a cure to, to many of those diseases. Or at least it's a preventive to ensure the conditions don't get worse. So it's more than just uh, weight. But it's an old science. The physicians have known about the links between food and, and health for generations, but it's been overtaken by the new technologies, by drugs and by new equipment and new diagnosis. And as a result, that old science has slipped away. It's time we rebuilt that old science, those old understandings, and put an evidence base underneath them so that they can sit alongside modern medicine. That old adage, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, has some significant truth in it. Based upon informed research, it is estimated that up to 5% of the population of Europe, the world's richest region, are malnourished. Malnutrition is Europe's hidden weight problem. It affects the most vulnerable in society, the elderly at home or in nursing homes and hospitals, and the sick. In this film, we reveal how the issue of the undernourished, malnourished is under-recognized and therefore under-treated. It not only ruins and costs lives, but managing its consequences costs approximately three times that of obesity, the current weight obsession of governments and the media. So while the obesity epidemic is debated by the media on a daily basis, and public health policy increasingly seeks to encourage people to eat less, people that are underweight or malnourished often go unnoticed Now, leading clinicians across Europe are bringing the scale and nature of this hidden weight-related problem to light. Several transcontinental investigations show that one-third of patients in hospitals and nursing homes are malnourished. In the countries of the EU in general, more than 10% of individuals aged over 65 years are undernourished. Well, I think in Europe today we have uh, still a very uh, major problem with malnutrition in hospitals and also in, in any kind of care situation. In fact, a very recent investigation of some 30,000 people in the hospitals, but also in, uh, in uh, some uh, other care uh, nursing homes, uh, show that almost 50% uh, of all the patients were, had signs of uh, disease-related malnutrition. So it's a, it's a huge problem. Disease is one of the commonest causes of uh, malnutrition in developed countries. It often occurs with uh, chronic illnesses as well as acute illnesses. And since illness increases with age and diseases increases with age, it's not surprising that the prevalence of malnutrition also increases with age. Uh, in addition to these physical causes, there are social determinants, uh, poverty, isolation and bereavement. Our nutritional needs change as we age, but the link between a good diet and staying healthy remains. It is difficult to be specific about how much to eat because the way we digest, absorb, use and excrete nutrients not only changes as we age, it also varies widely between individuals. 
It is important to eat a variety of different kinds of foods too. This is not just to spice up our lives, though that's important too, but because older people who have a monotonous diet or who exclude whole food groups are at risk of missing out on key nutrients. Fruit and vegetables, whole wheat bread and other cereals, fish and meat, or vegetarian alternatives including pulses, milk and dairy foods. If you know what day of the week it is from what's on the menu, you probably don't have enough variety and therefore nutrients in your diet. We really do need to eat as many types of food as possible. Our social structure of today also makes it uh, perhaps more easy for people to get malnourished. Uh, many people live alone uh, in their own houses. Uh, they miss out on the social experience of eating together, which is really one of the key aspects of, of everyday living. When this is lost, then uh, it's easy not to feed themselves uh, properly. If you're working in a hospital, um, you really can expect that every third or every fourth patient has this problem. And usually this is a problem uh, which professionals, nurses, doctors or physiotherapists are not really aware of. The health implications of malnutrition are enormous and come into sharp focus when people enter hospital. Research from the UK shows that malnourished individuals stay in hospital longer and succumb to infection more often. They visit their general practitioner more frequently and require more intensive nursing care than individuals who are adequately nourished. Uh, malnutrition um, causes weakness. It is uh, nothing really new. It's obvious if you lose, um, for example, muscle mass, you will lose muscle strength. The patient becomes weaker and there is an increased risk of infection-related complications. The length of stay in the hospital is often prolonged too. Medical consequences and poor outcomes vary from patient to patient. Many of these patients, like Karen and Eric, are unable to lead normal lives and have a diminished quality of life. I was born in the Shetland Islands and 30 years ago. They weren't very hot on nutrition then, so um, as a child I was very sicky, frequently projectile vomiting, and mum took me backwards and forwards to the doctor, but they just thought she was a neurotic mother and that, uh, you know, babies sort themselves out, get on with it sort of thing. So um, right from being born I had problems. A few years ago, I was in town when, suddenly, I had difficulty in climbing the stairs. It surprised me, and I was given iron supplements. They seemed to work, so I stopped worrying about it. At a later date, I started to bleed and lost a lot of blood from my intestinal tract. Within a month, I was on the operating table having my entire stomach removed. The really tough time came with the chemo and radiation therapy, which drastically affects your appetite. It was almost impossible to put something in my mouth and swallow it. That sounds dramatic, but it really felt like that. At one point, quite early on in the whole process, I could tell that the weight was really dropping off me. I asked to have a tube inserted. This was done eight days later, when I was admitted to hospital for a week. But no, the artificial nutrition has cured my malnutrition. Uh, it, you know, that, that's no longer an issue for me. I mean, yes, you know, I have the tubes and I have to use you know, the pump regularly, but you soon get used to that. And I, I did have a period where I rebelled against it and I tried not to use the pump because I didn't want to. After the cancer treatment was over with, it was a while before I could tell whether my weight was going up or down. Over the last three or four weeks, it seems as if I'm slowly beginning to gain some weight. I've put on about a kilo, and it seems as if I'm able to maintain this without too much difficulty. 
That's my opinion, judging by what I see on the scales. It's very restrictive and it's, it's difficult because food is such a social activity. And everyone says, oh, let's go out for a meal, you know. But my friends and family have adapted very well. And, you know, my quality of life since I began tube feeding has improved hugely. Definitely. That's made a massive difference to me. It's meant I've been able to get back to work which is really important because it's such a big part of your sort of identity, what you do. And I'm able to do something that I really enjoy. So although I can only work a few hours a day, I do really enjoy it, which is really important. In an attempt to galvanise interest in the issue, in 2003, the Council of the European Union accepted and recognised that undernutrition in hospital patients leads to extended hospital stays, prolonged rehabilitation and diminished quality of life. This resolution is based on a human rights concept and was aimed at ensuring that nutrition should be an imperative part of the medical treatment. One of the main driving forces of the development within the health system is um, to increase the, the power, the influence or whatever of those who already have the power and the influence. And, and the food belongs to the kitchen and the kitchen does not have much power or influence. If the health and human rights arguments are not winning the day, perhaps the financial implications can put malnutrition on the agenda. In 2006, a report published by the British Association for Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition examines the costs. According to this report, treating malnutrition in hospitals, care facilities, GPs clinics and the community costs the UK more than £10 billion each year. Well, the two major causes of expenses of costs for malnutrition occur in hospitals and, uh, and also in social care outside hospitals. Now, although a very small proportion of the population at any one time stays in hospital, hospitals are extremely expensive. And if the prevalence of malnutrition is something like 30%, on admission to hospital, which is one of the findings of our recent national survey here, uh, one can imagine that uh, the cost associated with that. The solutions to malnutrition exist. They should be the screening of each patient entering a healthcare institution. Progress is being made, but very slowly. The screening instrument, NRS 2002, uh, has a lot in common with other screening instruments. Uh, it uh, gathers information on the present body weight of the patient, the BMI, recent weight loss of the patient, and uh, recent uh, food intake, whether or not the patient has decreased his or her food intake over the last uh, week or so. The Nutrition Day is an international project with its coordinating centre in Austria. It aims to improve knowledge and awareness of malnutrition by using a simple screening test for nutritional risk. Nutrition Day is one of the biggest uh, research projects that have been run in an international network to promote awareness and to increase uh, precise information about malnutrition related to diseases. It covered a population of more than 50,000 patients in Europe and now also outside of Europe we are probably uh, going just around the globe. Typically we are able to provide questionnaires in more than 25 uh, languages so any patient hospitalized in Europe should be able to answer the questionnaire that is very simple in his mother tongue. The main information about nutrition history and actual intake came from the patients. And it was one of the very surprising findings in the Nutrition Day project that less than 40% of patients eat all what they are served in a hospital. There is also in hospitals 
a substantial proportion of patients that are eating nothing, around one out of eight patients, despite the fact that they are allowed to eat. Nutritional solutions are already available and in use to provide tailored solutions to malnourished individuals or patients at risk, whether they're living in the community, in care homes or in hospitals. However, they should be much more widely used. Nutritionists and the medical nutrition industry are keen to establish nutrition protocols as a routine part of disease management so that corrective action can be taken by GPs in the community and by caregivers and healthcare professionals in care homes and hospitals. The European Nutrition for Health Alliance, the ENHA, believes that there is more recognition of malnutrition in Europe today than five years ago but believe more can be done as it's unacceptable to neglect nutritional care in the 21st century. The, the main reason uh, of starting the alliance is that they're not in, in both the European, in the professional arenas, as well as the institutional healthcare arenas, uh, nutrition and health is not being given proper attention. Um, it's mainly being seen, looked at as a cost factor it costs money and therefore in terms of negotiations with healthcare insurance and governments it is looked at as a, as a bulk product, a service to patients that needs to be done rather than part of the solution uh, for a patient in the healthcare delivery chain. In relation to this very large background of course, well, the, the EU uh, is only one of the players but the EU nonetheless can do quite a lot. Uh, in terms of uh, both in relation to addressing the general uh, issues posed by an aging population, the, how you actually make, try and make sure that people stay in good health, but also how you make sure that the health care systems uh, respond. The European Society of Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism, ESPEN, aims to encourage the rapid diffusion of knowledge of the importance of screening and effectiveness of nutritional solutions to create a climate of shared responsibility for the issue. ESPEN plays a very central role in the development of clinical practice, uh, gaining new knowledge in the field of clinical nutrition, uh, educational issues uh, and perhaps also most important, importantly as a meeting point for many people of different professions. It's a multidisciplinary society. Having everybody involved in the, in the clinical nutrition treatment uh, from all different kinds of disciplines as well within the medical society uh, to get together and learn from each other and to bring forward new uh, guidelines and uh, uh, new knowledge about nutritional care. The medical nutrition industry also promotes the implementation of existing measures and resources given for the training of health and care staff in all settings. The industry contributes to identifying the malnourished patients and to providing appropriate treatment and support. The medical nutrition industry provides solutions for malnutrition and for related disorders. Uh, these come in the form of tube feeds, oral nutritional supplements, as well as parenteral nutrition. But we provide not only products, but also services to elderly homes, healthcare homes, etc. And we strive to prove to the healthcare systems the value of these solutions. We believe that medical nutrition should be an integral part of disease management, so included also in the disease management protocols. National initiatives to enhance understanding and promote good practice in nutritional care and support are slowly gathering momentum. Some progress in establishing systems and policies to prevent malnutrition has been achieved. In 2007, the European Society for Clinical Nutrition and Metabolism, ESPEN, the European Nutrition for Health Alliance, ENHA, the Medical Nutrition International Industries, MNI, and the members and partners of these organizations have joined forces to fight malnutrition in Europe and signed the Prague Declaration 2007. This alliance is dedicated to propose and implement changes 
and to raise awareness from the most relevant healthcare stakeholders, including physicians, healthcare managers, insurers, industry and advocacy institutions. We would like to have all hospitals screen patients at admission for malnutrition and then treat them in an early phase. And the, the step two is that we want to screen all patients uh, in the outpatient clinic because if you go to your home physician, you can just go for a, yeah, a sore throat or something like that. But if it's real wrong, you have to go to a specialist in the hospital and there you already have patients who are at risk. Recognition of the malnutrition issue on the health of European citizens and on healthcare systems made a great step forward in October 2008. The Committee on Environment, Public Health and Food Safety of the European Parliament has included malnutrition as a key priority in the 2008 to 2013 EU health strategy. In this strategy, malnutrition will be given equal weighting with other key health challenges in Europe, such as cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, mental ill health and obesity. If we find that in a particular country or a particular region there is a, a very good project which is aimed at improving the, the health of uh, elderly people or particular groups, we can, we can use our resources to disseminate this kind of, uh, of project to make sure that uh, you know, best practice can be spread throughout the whole of Europe. In Europe we have very high life expectancies for men and women and this is increasing year on year. But it's also very important to think not just in terms of the total life lived, but actually how long, for how much of the life lived are people in good health. The case and capability to combat under-recognition and under-treatment is compelling on health, humanitarian and economic grounds. Obesity is not the only nutritional problem facing our society. Fighting undernutrition and malnutrition is a human right and a societal obligation. So, what does it take to make things change? So it's interesting that the discussion is now ongoing and people are talking about it. It is becoming an issue and that's very encouraging. Uh, I think that conversations have got a long way to go yet, but it's talking, it's helping, the issue, the profile is being raised. I think for anyone who's, who, who's just being diagnosed with malnutrition, I think, you know, malnutrition is actually fairly easy to treat. Even if it means you do end up with a feeding tube, it doesn't stop you doing normal things. You know, it, it, it's very discreet. Other people don't have to know. So malnutrition can be treated and it can make a huge difference to how you feel and, and can improve your quality of life. I, I'm optimistic that we can change this state of things. There's many people and many experts that have gathered good scientific evidence to show we have a problem and we can solve it. So we are giving these instruments, the sci scientists are giving these instruments to uh, political decision makers and we hope they start changing their mind. But we need also the lay public to be aware that they have a problem and to demand uh, their problem to be solved. Until people don't demand it, it may be difficult. An, an extra problem is that in every country you have different regulations and a different approach. So there are some countries where this is a real problem that's been tackled with uh, government initiatives and some other countries where you don't have absolutely anything done in this area. But I'm optimistic. The chances of success of such a program is, is, is quite good, especially if we could get everybody together to, uh, to do something about it and move it from very different angles at the same time. This will have a greater impact. And I think the, the most important issue is actually gaining recognition of the problem itself in every instance. Mm -hmm.